Hello, welcome back to our next topic of interest, which is going to be the cardiovascular system. Uh, we've, we've talked about the material being transported through the cardiovascular system. We've talked about how uh, the immune and lymphatic systems integrate with the cardiovascular system. Uh, it is now ready to, we are now ready to talk about uh, the organization and the function of the cardiovascular system. Uh, and as the name implies, cardiovascular, uh, we've got two different aspects of the system that we need to pay attention to. Uh, the first of that is the heart, and then we also need to look at blood vessels. Uh, and so uh, in this series of videos, which should only be about three, uh, we're going to look at the anatomy of both the heart and the blood vessels, which you've kind of already done in lab or are doing in lab. And um, our next topic will be to really look at the physiology of these systems. Uh, so uh, with that, let's go ahead and jump into our first bit of information, uh, which is really a, uh, a review of um, the heart and structures that are associated uh, with the heart. And so uh, our main focus here is going to be on uh, the arrangement of cardiac muscle. Um, with that said, a couple things that we want to really focus on here, and or not focus on, but really keep in mind, is uh, we're dealing with a structure. We're dealing with a structure that is uh, approximately 350 grams in mass. And that's the mass mass of the heart. Um, we're dealing with um, a system that is uh, or I should say a structure that is beating approximately 10,000 times per day. All right, now you can multiply that by 7 days a week by 365 days a year and we have a uh, buttload of beats per year. All right. Um, large, massive amounts of beats per year. I mean, we're talking about um, we're talking about three million six hundred and fifty uh, thousand beats a year, um, and that's nonstop because we know that if it, if it stops, we're we're in trouble. All right. When we look at blood vessels and we look at the function of the blood vessels, uh, we need to take into consideration that we are not just transporting blood, but we are also transporting water, oxygen, CO2, N2, nitric oxide, NO2. Uh, we've got proteins that the blood vessels are going to be responsible for transporting. We have hormones. We have white blood cells. Uh, and we have what we will simply call nitrogenous waste. Um, and so uh, all of this is... Um, becomes critical because if our cardiovascular system is not functioning properly, then uh, quite a few other systems, all other systems, cease to function and operate as well. Uh, and so uh, lots, to, lots to consider here when we look at the importance of this system. Um, the location, all right, where we are dealing with as far as the heart, remember the heart is part of the thoracic cavity. Uh, and more specifically, it is encapsulated within its own cavity called the pericardial 
cavity. And the pericardial cavity is made up of a structure called the pericardium. And so the heart resides within the pericardial cavity. And you can see here, and you can also see if you've, uh, in the lab, um, the, this pericardial sac, this pericardium is a very tough, fibrous uh, layer of connective tissue. All right? In fact, we refer to this as the fibrous pericardium. We refer to this as the fibrous pericardium because it is just that tough. Um, it's very dense. Um, it's not really flexible. It's not designed to be uh, functional beyond the point of providing separation and protection to the heart. Because again, if the heart ceases its function, uh, then what ends up happening is um, blood stops circulating. And again, you've got a major homeostatic failure that will lead to death. Now, once we get through the fibrous pericardium, um, we have on the inside what is defined as being the serous pericardium. Uh, which is divided into two layers, the parietal and the visceral layer. Um, the parietal layer uh, is attached to the deep side of the fibrous pericardium. All right, so when you remove the fibrous pericardium and you'll look on the underside, uh, you're looking at the parietal layer. Then there is a small space, what we call the pericardial space. Uh, and... Um, Attached to the heart is a very clear, thin, transparent layer of the pericardium, what we call the visceral pericardium, or the visceral layer, and that directly adheres to that directly adheres to the outer layer of the heart. Uh, with a little bit of diligence, you can actually start to separate the uh, the uh, visceral pericardium away from the heart. It is not easy. Um, because it's just that adhered to the uh, what we call the epicardium or the outer muscular layer of the heart, uh, and as you can see here, uh, there is pericardial fluid that is uh, found between the parietal and the visceral layer of the pericardium, right. and the purpose of the uh, pericardial fluid within the pericardial space is to simply provide uh, lubrication. In other words, it's a reduction of friction. So there's a lot of uh, frictional force, there's a lot of rubbing between the heart and the pericardium uh, and then the surrounding pleural cavity where we find the lungs. And so again, 10,000 beats a day, um, th over 3 million beats per year uh, if there was not some way of reducing that friction, the heart would constantly be rubbing up against the pericardium, which would constantly be rubbing up against the, um, the pleural cavity in the lungs, and you're going to have a wearing down of tissue, and that's not advantageous for maintaining homeostasis. And so uh, the, the pericardial fluid is there to provide a barrier to reduce friction. <clears throat> and uh, this here just kind of shows again um, that overall organization and structure that we see within uh, that we see within the pericardial sac or the pericardium. All right, so here's the uh, here's the heart. Here's the pericardial cavity. This needs to fit inside of this. All right. And so, um, almost like taking your fist and pressing it into a water balloon, that water balloon is going to wrap around your fist. And that's exactly what we're seeing here with the pericardial cavity. It's wrapping itself around um, the heart. Part of that is because the aortic arch and the pulmonary uh, trunk and the uh, superior vena cava needs to be exposed. And so you don't see that pericardial cavity completely wrapping itself all the way around. Um, otherwise, it would cut off uh, the vasculature that's coming into and exiting the heart. 
but you can see here that the heart fits into here. Right? Again, this outer layer that you're looking at right there, that is the um, parietal layer of the pericardium. Right? And then the inner layer that you're looking at right here, that is the visceral layer of the pericardium. And then you see you've got this pericardial space or this pericardial cavity. And that is where the pericardial fluid is going to reside. You should already be aware that there are three layers to uh, the heart, the musculature of the heart. The epicardium, the myocardium, and the endocardium. Uh, the epicardium, by its very name, is the outer layer of the heart, epi, meaning on or above or around. Uh, and it is the epicardium where the visceral um, pericardium sits on top of and is attached. Right, so that visceral pericardium is attached to the epicardium. The myocardium is the uh, cardiac muscle. Right, so that is the cardiac muscle, that is the, the muscular tissue that is going to allow for uh, the ventricles and the atria to contract. Right, and then we have the endocardium, endo meaning within. And so this is the layer of the heart that is lining the chambers. Right, so remember we have four chambers. We have a right and a left atrium, and we have a right and a left uh, ventricle. Right? And it's the endocardium that lines these chambers of the heart. Uh, these, uh, the endocardium is made up of specialized epithelial cells called endothelial cells or endothelium. And that simply allows for um, diffusion of waste from the cardiac muscle uh, into the blood and it also allows things like oxygen and other nutrients to go ahead and diffuse across that epithelial lining to be able to go ahead and sub sufficiently supply cardiac muscle. Uh, in addition to um, all of the coronary arteries and veins that are surrounding the heart as well. Uh, the endocardium is very often a target of bacterial infection and so uh, you can have bacterium, um, specifically Staphylococcus uh, bacterium, that will go ahead and very often leave the oral cavity, find its way into the bloodstream, and uh, it tends to have an affinity um, or an attraction to those endothelial cells. And so what that will cause is it will cause inflammation within the chamber that is most affected. Um, and of course that inflammation is swelling and where you've got swelling you've got a restriction of exchange of material uh, and you also have a reduction in what we would define as stroke volume or cardiac output and those terms that will, will be uh, two terms that we go over a little bit later in our conversation um, not in this video but in a couple other videos uh, down the road and so here again you can see um, here is the whole heart. We're going to take this section, which is right here, right? and we're going to be able to look at this. And so this is actually uh, part of the um, pericardium with the layers of the heart all combined into uh, one diagram. And so this pink layer that you're looking at right here, that is the fibrous pericardium. And then you have the uh, parietal layer of the pericardium. You have the pericardial space or the pericardial cavity. And then this inner blue layer right here would be the visceral pericardium, which is directly attached to uh, the uh, epicardium, followed by the myocardium, followed by the endocardium. This would be the inside lining of the right ventricle. And so here you've got a complete picture of the organization of the heart. And here's another view of that just a little bit bigger. I think you can probably see it better on this enlarged image right here. Again, 
Uh, the fibrous pericardium is this outer layer. This first blue layer would be the parietal pericardium, followed by the pericardial cavity or space, All right. followed by the innermost layer of the pericardium, which would be the visceral pericardium. And then this thinner layer right here would be the uh, endocardium, I'm sorry, the epicardium, followed by the myocardium, uh, followed by the endocardium. So the overall structure uh, of cardiac muscle is something that I want to focus on over the next couple of slides. This is actually where we're going to be spending uh, the bulk of the remainder of our time together looking at. Um, and so uh, we know that the cardiac tissue or the myocardium uh, is made up of specialized muscular cells called cardiocytes right? uh, and that these cardiocytes are branched right? and through the branching they form a interwoven um, network of muscular cells that are able to go ahead and uh, communicate simultaneously with all of the other cells around it. And one of the things that we need to do is we need to really try to understand how do these cardiac cells all within the right ventricle all function and stimulate at the same time. Because all of the cells in the right ventricle and the left ventricle all have to contract or aid in contraction at the same time. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get a wave of contraction through the ventricle. And so parts of it is going to contract while other parts are not going to contract. That's going to reduce, again, this idea of stroke volume, which is going to impact cardiac output, which is going to really just mess up the whole system as we begin to go through the system and understand about directionality and flow of blood. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to kind of take a look at a couple pictures of this organization as well. Remember that cardiac muscle, uh, cardiocytes, myocardium, uh, has striations. It's one of the characteristics of cardiac muscle, uh, which means that we're going to have these overlapping areas of thick and thin myofilaments, um, things that you did not necessarily see within the organization of smooth muscle, um, but things that you did see things that you did see within the organizational units of a sarcomere going back to skeletal muscle in AMP1. Uh, we do have T-tubules. Right? This is again something that is very characteristic of skeletal muscle. We see it again within cardiac muscle. Uh, you did not see T-tubules uh, within smooth muscle. All right. And the other thing that we have, and this is kind of unique to cardiac muscle, um, is uh, this idea of an intercalated disc. And so we're going to take a look at the organization, the anatomy of that intercalated disc. You've looked at this histologically, uh, but what does this actually look like um, anatomically? All right, you can identify this back again from AMP1. You can identify an intercalated disc. But what are the anatomical features? Right? Why is that intercalated disc important? We know it aids in communication and this idea of autorhythmicity, right, where uh, the ventricles are self regulating for contraction. Um, but what does that entail? And as we will find out, um, we have these three structures that we need to consider, um, the fascia adherens, these things called desmosomes, and gap junctions as well. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to take a look at that coming up here in a few slides. I did want to point this out to you um, first, though, just so you can kind of get an idea of the overall organization. Right, and so this here is a cardio site. This is a cell, um, or at least a region of the cell, um, that is making up the heart. Right? Again, you can see these overlapping areas of thick and thin uh, myofilaments that are making up a sarcomere. All right, um, And so you can see that one complete unit of, here's an I band, here's an A band, where you've got overlapping thick and thin myofilaments. 
right, you've got your H zone, which is just your thick myofilaments, and then you have another area of I bands, which is again just your thin myofilaments. Um, that complete organizational structure is what we would define as being one complete unit from here to here is what we would define as again being a sarcomere. Right. And so this is a this is a review of A and P1 largely. You can see those T tubules that are coming in there. Um, lots and lots of mitochondria as there's lots and lots of energy that is needed to maintain uh, contraction within the myocardium. Uh, and we've got sarcoplasmic reticulum. Why? Because we're going to need to have a source of uh, calcium that is going to be present. I will say because of the rapid speed at which um, calcium is utilized in cardiac function, the sarcoplasmic reticulum lack uh, terminal cisterns. doesn't really have to uh, uh, separate it for very long and so that, there, that, that idea of having that extra area of separation and storage uh, is not something that we see within cardiac muscle. So yes, they have sarcoplasmic reticulum. It serves as a reservoir for calcium, um, but they do not have the terminal cisterns that we uh, would identify with uh, in skeletal muscle. Um, here again is just another view of that level of organization and structure. All right? uh, and what we want to pay attention to here is what is happening in this area right here. Because what you are seeing, what you are seeing is this structure which is the same thing as that structure. Uh, these guys right there, these are those intercalated discs. Right, they are the intercalated discs. And so let's go ahead and uh, take a look at this a little bit closer. Um, one of the things that we see going uh, vertical, in other words, going up and down, one of the things that is allowing for, all right, here's one cell. Let me pull up my pen. Here's one cell. All right. On top of that is another cell. All right, so here's a second cell right here. Well, these two cells need to communicate. And that is what you are seeing right there. Right, those tiny little blue structures that you're seeing right there, they're gap junctions. And those gap junctions allow for vertical communication. And coordination of chamber contraction. In other words, the ventricles and the atria. What allows the myocardium um, associated, not the myocardium, the, uh, yeah, the myocardium. What allows the myocardium or the cardiac muscle um, to contract um, simultaneously within the ventricles and the atria is the fact that these gap junctions allow for intercellular communication. They allow for intercellular communication. Now, adjacent cells... All right, so in other words, here is an intercalated disc. You can see a couple more intercalated discs right here. Right? Uh, in this image here, if you think about this, it almost looks like you ever see those foam egg cartons all right? um, or a foam mattress pad. It's got those little dips in it. All right? uh, it's really what these uh, intercalated discs look like, and that just allows for a tighter linkage uh, between one cell and another cell that are adjacent. So you've got one cell here, and you have another cell here. Here's one cell, here's a second cell. All right, well, uh, here's one cell, and then right here, you would have another cell. And so what this diagram is looking at right here is, here's one cell, all right, here's cell number three, this is cell number three. All right. This is all cell number one. 
right here, this is cell number 1, right there. So we're looking at that intercalated disk that is joining or adhering uh, cell number 1 to cell number 3, right here. And what we see at the formation here are these proteins that are uh, embedded into the intercalated disk on either side. And those proteins are called desmosomes. Think of the desmosome as being, um, you know, the, um, the tacks um, that will go through um, if you've got a bind um, a large packet of paper together and it's hole punched you can take those tacks and stick it through the hole and on the back end spread the spread the little wings all right and a paper fastener all right um, and now those those papers are clumped together well think of think of that as being the intercalated disc think of that stack of paper as being the intercalated disc think of the three hole punch holes going down the side as being uh, a channel that is going to join one adjacent cell with the next adjacent cell across that intercalated disk. Right? The paper fastener is the desmosome. Right? It anchors, if you would, it anchors um, the adjacent cells together through that point of contact. Right? That's what your desmosomes do. Um, and then what we've now newly discovered is that there are these what we call fascia adherence. And so if you look closely uh, in this area right here, all right, so here's your desmosome. All right, there's one part, there's a second part. Well, you've got these little dots that are in between the two parts of the desmosome. Those little dots are actually uh, collagen um, or elastic fibers, not collagen, but elastic fibers that we refer to as fascia adherens. And the fascia adherens act as little rubber bands across the intercalated disc. So as the muscle is contracting, as those cells are contracting, they're both shrinking. And when they shrink, you pull on the intercalated discs. Well, if there's no give in there, you're going to rip and tear the intercalated discs, and then you're going to lose the ability to coordinate contractional function and contractional activity. So those fascia adherens are there um, to go ahead and maintain integrity across the intercalated discs. Right? And that's exactly what you're seeing again right here. Here's your, here is your intercalated disc right there. There's your gap junction. There's your gap junction. This is allowing for uh, vertical articulation and communication between adjacent cells. Right. And then here you've got your desmosomes. And you can see those fascia adherens really well in this view right there. That's your fascia adherens. And that's your fascia adherence. And again, they act as little rubber bands to go ahead and prevent uh, the complete separation of those intercalated discs that are joining together those adjacent um, cardiocytes. And so think of the desmosomes and the fascia adherence as stabilizing horizontal communication, whereas gap junctions are allowing and aiding in vertical communications. And so uh, we're going to stop there for right now. Um, that was kind of a real quick, uh, brief uh, overview of um, the anatomy of cardiocytes uh, and a good introduction into our look at the heart. And so uh, go ahead, take your time, uh, do some review. And uh, when you're ready, you can start video two. Until then, I'll catch you on the flip side.